To change or overcome, that's the name of the, or the title rather, of my, uh, of my lesson tonight. The great dreamers and idealists throughout history have all had the same hope. And that was to somehow change or create a better world. Some, like artists and scientists or philanthropists, have managed to improve the world. For example, to lessen the suffering through medical discoveries. Or make life easier by inventing new technologies and new products. Some have promoted a more just society by empowering the weak or distributing wealth more equitably. All good things. Of course, there are those who throughout history thought that they were improving the world when in reality they were doing the opposite. They were making it worse. For example, Hitler's ideal of a superior and thus better race actually resulted in death and misery for millions of people, including his own. And then there are any number of philosophers and artists who wanted to liberate man by removing basic restraints and moral guidelines that had been in place for centuries, only to send an entire generation down the road of self-indulgence and immorality that threatens to destroy the moral fabric of today's society. A lot of the crazy ideas that are in today's society that are breaking down our society today started 100 years ago by people who thought, we're, we're going to do it right. We're going we're to break down all these moral codes and everything and people will be better because of it. And we know that people have not been better because of it. And these idealists, all of them, whether their ideas produced good or bad, all of them wanted exactly the same thing. They wanted to change the world. That's what they wanted to do. Many of them made changes in the world and improved some aspects of it for good at times. But no one actually succeeds or succeeded in changing the world itself in any way that would stop its decay or improve mankind's character to a point where evil was eliminated. Nobody did that. No matter how high the ideas, no matter how noble, no matter how far seeing, the world hasn't changed. In those most basic things, no idealist has been able to bring about significant or permanent change. There is one man, however, who made this a better world, not by improving it or by changing it. And of course, we know that that man is Jesus Christ. And the things that he did made this place a better world, not by changing it, but by overcoming it. There's a difference. I want to tell you something. If anyone could have changed or improved the world, it would have been Jesus Christ. Paul says of him in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he says the following in speaking of Jesus. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Are you hearing what Paul is saying about Jesus and the power that He had? He said the world was made through His power, therefore He knows how it works better than anyone. Paul says that he has miraculous power, so he has the ability to make any change that he wants. And actually when we read the Gospels we find out some of the changes. You know, he took a few bread and a few fish and multiplied them, right? We saw the power that he had to change things if he wanted. A person who couldn't walk could walk. A person who was blind uh, could now see. So we, we, we saw the power that he had to change things. Paul says that the world was created for his purpose, so he has the right to change things if he wants to. And yet, 
in the face of all of this privilege and all of this power concerning the world, what does Jesus choose to do? Did He change the world for the better? Did He save the environment? Did He improve man's uh, lifestyle? Well, He didn't do any one of these things. And yet He had the power to do it if He wanted to. Instead, what does Jesus do? Instead, Jesus proceeds to overcome the world, as John records His words, not change it and not improve it. And Jesus does this so that others will be empowered to do so as well. You see, we cannot change the world. We can only overcome the world. That's the only thing that we can do. To change or to overcome, these are the options that we have. Now to change the world, you know, the problem with idealists, whether they're good or bad, is that they think they can change things and they think they can improve things you know, on a permanent basis. And they're partly right. They can change things to a degree and relieve the suffering, for example, by a, maybe a couple of notches. The mistake that they make is thinking that the change will last or the improvements will contribute to a final goal where the world will be changed for the better once and for all. I mean, that's the, that's the evolutionary model. You know, we're always improving, we're always getting better. The great hope of idealists is that they have contributed a piece that will ultimately result in the complete transformation of the world. That's their hope, that's the thing that they hang on to. This is the nature of the idealist's faith, the substance of their vision, the passion that drives their work, and the many sacrifices that they make on behalf of their ideal. To change the world is the idealist's form of salvation and eternal life. Making such a contribution makes him or her immortal in some way. I've contributed to making the world a better place. Option number two is to overcome the world. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He could have said, I've changed the world, or I've started a change that will change the world, but He didn't say that. He said, I have overcome the world. A lot different, a lot different. He didn't say this because Jesus knew that there is no changing the world or improving it to the point where it will become an ideal place. I mean, there are some places that are ideal, you know, in context. The United States is an ideal place to live in comparison to uh, uh, Somalia in Africa. You know, if you had the choice, you know, where would you want to live? But we know that even in our own country, even in our own cities, even in our own communities, there are less than ideal conditions and people live in much less than ideal situations. Jesus wasn't a pessimist. He was a realist. He knew two important things about the world. One, he knew that since Adam's disobedience Sin had come into the world and along with it, death to every man. Jesus knew all men sinned and all men suffered and died and, these would be, and there would be no changing or improving this. You can't change that basic situation that sin and death are in the world. You can't change that situation by changing something mechanical in the world, by making sure everybody has food or everybody have, has health care. You know what I'm saying? Everybody has enough money to buy what they want. That's, that's, that's not the antidote to sin and death. The evil in the world simply runs in cycles. Sometimes the evil is very high, you know, the, the quotient of evil taking place in the world is very high and sometimes it's kind of low, but it's always 
in that cycle. During World War II, people thought it was the end of the world. They thought that Hitler was the Antichrist. You know, they thought he couldn't get any worse. And then the war was over, and then there was a period of prosperity and relative peace. You know, up and down and up and down. It just goes up and down, the cycle of evil in the world. But we know it will always be there, this cycle, until the end of time when Jesus returns. And then, and then the second thing that Jesus knew about the world was that since the great flood in Noah's day, the perfect earth created by God was damaged beyond repair. All the environmental care and laws would never restore the earth to its pristine condition. The only, only the slow decay, only the slowing of its decay rather, which is a good thing, was possible. We manage the earth, we manage the resources, we slow, we try to slow down its devolution, not its evolution, its devolution, but that's all we, that's all we can do. Jesus' understanding of this and His divine nature enabled Him to do the only thing that will change, not the world, but will change us. Jesus, the Son of God, knew that the world and everything in it was perishing and the only hope for anyone, the only ideal, the only dream was to leave this world by overcoming it. That's what he came to do. That was the message he came to give us. That's the message we should be telling the world. You better get out, this place is on fire. You better, you better save yourself because this place is going to disappear. Now overcoming the world involved you know, a couple of steps here. I'd like to share those with you. First of all, in order to overcome the world, you have to overcome disbelief. What keeps idealists in this unending cycle of trying to change a world that will not change is their disbelief. They don't believe that man's sinfulness is the cause of his death and downfall. That's way too simplistic. Only simple-minded people believe that, the idealist thinks. Idealists refuse to believe that God destroyed the earth because of sin, the flood, you know? Well, that's, you know, that's not scientific. You know, if you want to believe that myth, they say, you go right ahead, you know? but that's, that's not, science doesn't support that, and we know that observation does support that. It's just whose observation gets printed <laughs> that is the, the problem. Idealists refuse to believe that man has only the power that God gives him and without God, man can do nothing. Idealists don't believe that because they're way too proud to believe that. They think that their destiny is in their own hands. By revealing the Father, by revealing the power of His miracles, Jesus overcame the disbelief that was in the hearts of the people that he served. Now, people had reason to believe because God was among them in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, in order to, uh, in order to overcome the world, you have to believe. And Jesus provided the proof to help us believe. Overcoming the world also requires to overcome sin. You know, man can mitigate sin, rationalize sin, justify sin, deny sin, enjoy sin, promote sin, but he can't get rid of sin. He can do all those other things, but he can't get rid of sin. Jesus lived a sinless life in order to overcome sin on our behalf. Then he died on the cross to obtain forgiveness for all of our sins. And finally, he sent the Holy Spirit to give us the power to deal with sin in our own lives. By taking our sins upon Himself, Jesus enabled every person to be totally healed from sin, not just treat its symptoms. We overcome sin through forgiveness, not through self-improvement. A lot of people in this world think the way to overcome sin or faults or you know, weaknesses is through a continual effort at self-improvement. Well, you can get so far with that. 
you can discipline yourself so far, but in order to get rid of sin and in order to be rid of the condemnation that comes from all of your sins in the past, that requires forgiveness. And in order to overcome the world, you have to overcome sin. And the way to overcome sin is by being forgiven for the sins that we have committed in our lives. And in order to receive that forgiveness, we have to believe in Jesus Christ. And then overcoming the world involves, as I said, overcoming disbelief, overcoming sin, and then thirdly, overcoming death. You know, three days after they killed him, Jesus is raised from the dead to demonstrate that the door that locked us into this world and into its fate was now open and those following Jesus could now go through and pass on to the other side. This morning in one of our classes in the First Thessalonian, we were talking about you know, what happens after somebody dies. And you know, that's kind of a metaphysical question. You know? I mean, has anybody died and kind of observed and then come back and said, okay, I, I know what happened. There are a lot of people that nearly die on operating tables and so on and so forth. They have a certain experience, you know, but it's not, oh, well, what's the best they can say? Well, I saw a light, you know, or I had a warm feeling or something, but you know, that's, I, I don't know if I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. But Jesus, on the other hand, He dies. He's really dead, three days, He's really dead. And then He comes back from the dead. Him I will hear when it comes to telling me what happens after I die. His word I listen to because He was dead and then He was alive. Before, the fear of death kept us here, kept us working to create heaven on earth here. But now through Jesus we are free to go to the heaven that He has created for us. The only way to overcome death is to allow Jesus to overcome death for us and open the door to the, what I call the next dimension. And the next dimension, we call it heaven, we call it paradise, we call it eternal life. We call it a lot of different things, but one thing we know for sure, it isn't this place. We know this place isn't heaven. We know this place is not paradise. We know this isn't exactly what eternal life is. Nobody, you know, you imagine, imagine the following Jesus would have would say, look, I'll tell you what, if you believe in me, what I guarantee you is you're going to be alive on this earth forever. No, thank you. <laughs> you know. No, thank you. I don't want to be alive on this earth forever. Young people, they think, oh, it'd be nice to live to 100. Yeah, ask somebody who's 85 if they want to live to 110. You know, a lot of times, most of them say, no, no, thank you. Ask a Christian who's 85, you know, backache, sore this, sore that, you know, pills and all that. Ask him if he wants to live to 115. He goes, no, no, I want to go to be with the Lord now. The promise is not to live in this place forever. Who wants to live in this place forever? The promise is you get to go to the next dimension. You get to go to heaven. You get to get rid of this. You get to overcome this prison of earth and go into the place of freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from stress and worry and illness and pain and sorrow and regret. You get to go to that place, but you have to overcome the roadblock of death in order to go there. And that's what Jesus did. He didn't come here to change this place, to make this place paradise. He says, I'm going to show you how to get out of this place, to overcome death, so you'll be free to leave this place. You know, all of us have things we'd like to change in ourselves or in our surroundings. This is normal and it's part of a healthy attitude towards life, you know, wanting to make things better, sure. Remember, however, that our overall goal in life as Christians is not the process of change, it's the process of overcoming. We'll never change ourselves or the world enough 
to satisfy ourselves or to satisfy God. Overcoming, however, this is possible and it is required if you are to leave the world and become pleasing to yourself and to God forever. The first step, of course, in overcoming the world is to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and express that faith as He has commanded us in repentance and baptism. If you want to be an overcomer, if you've been held back and been trying to just change yourself and change the world, not realizing that God never asked you to do that, but has asked you instead, called you instead to overcome the world, if you need to take that first step in confessing Christ and being baptized, then we encourage you to come forward now as Dayton leads us in our song of encouragement.